great joy to be with you. I hope I can uh, inspire you tonight and uh, share a little bit of my story. We're talking about saints. And, uh, you know, there's nobody that inspires me more than Paul in the New Testament. Paul is an amazing figure because he was the most unlikely candidate to be a world changer. I mean, his mission was to destroy Christians, to destroy the church, and God gets a hold of him. And I want you to know, I don't know who you are or where you're from or where you're at in your journey or, you know, but I just believe that tonight God's going to get a hold of somebody that there's going to be world changers, history makers that are going to come out of this meeting tonight. Paul was on his way, you know, to arrest Christians when he met Jesus. You know, I met Jesus when I was in a trailer in Cranbrook, B.C., counting my money to see how much beer I could buy that night. Beer was a lot cheaper back then than it is now. Not that I would know, but Alex told me. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, anyway, and so I, you know, I'm counting my beer money, and this long-haired, blonde-haired guy came in. And within a few minutes, he had led me to Christ that night. I was just planning on, on getting drunk. I didn't know. Maybe, maybe someone brought you here tonight with a the, with the bribe that they're going to take you out for wings after. Or there's cute girls here or cute guys, depending which way you swing. And uh, that's a whole place I could just get in problems right there. I'm not, not going there tonight. I promised James I would behave. And, uh, but I honestly believe that you're not here by accident. I don't believe anybody's here by accident because I believe God's got something for you. And I want you to know that God just loves to do things through ordinary people. And I don't consider myself a, a somebody or a big wig or a father in the city. Come on, I'm not that old, James. You know, I appreciate that. But I, you know, I, I just think about, you know, there are just so many, you know, the Bible, the message of Jesus is for the whosoever's. You know, this life, this adventure of faith is for the whosoever's. Jesus said, hey, whosoever, he said, have faith in God because whosoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart that he shall have whatever he says, he, he will have it. Come on, this life of faith is for the whosoever. There was this one lady, she considered herself a nobody. Everybody looked at her and thought she was a nobody, you know, because she had an issue of blood. She was, you know, ceremonially unclean. She was a reject, an outcast. She was marginalized. She couldn't come into the crowd. She was embarrassed. She, maybe people felt repulsed by her. In people's eyes, she was a nobody. But she said within herself, if I can just touch Jesus, even the hem of his garment, I'm going to get healed. So she pushed herself through the crowd and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. He turned around and said, wait, somebody touched me. I want you to know, you might think that you're a, a nobody tonight. But if you can just get a touch of Jesus, come on. You can become a somebody. Come on. Because this message is for anybody. It's for the whosoever's. And so I'm going to talk to you. I've got my first scriptures coming up on the screen here. Acts 26, verse 16 and 19. We're going to unpack a little, about, a little bit about the apostle Paul. Because he went from being an enemy of the, of the church and of the gospel to writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Come on. You know, sometimes there's the man of the year or, you know, or, or the man of the hour. But I believe that Paul would be like the man of the millennium because of the impact that he had. And so we're going to bring out some of the characteristics of a world changer because I believe somebody's going to get a hold of this tonight. I believe in this meeting tonight there's going to be some world changers come out of it. Are you ready? So let's look at Acts chapter 26, verse 16 and 19. Paul is telling a story to King Agrippa. And he says, but rise, stand on your feet, for I've appeared to you. This is when Jesus met him. And, he said, and Jesus said to Paul, but arise, stand on your feet, for I've appeared to you for this purpose. Someone say purpose. purpose. I like that. To make you a minister or a servant and a witness. Someone say witness. witness. Do you know, I'm Italian. Do you know why Italians don't like Jehovah Witnesses? We don't like any witnesses. All right, but I tell you, I don't, so people ask me and they say, Anthony, what are you? Are you an apostle? Are you a pastor? Are you evangelist? Are you a teacher? You know, what, what are you? I'm not sure what I am, but I know one thing. I'm a witness. I'm a follower of Jesus. Come on. I'm a believer. And the Bible promises me that these signs shall follow them that believe. Come on. And so that's enough for me. I'm a witness. I've experienced Jesus. I had a God encounter in my life that changed the trajectory of my destiny. And you're going to have that encounter tonight too. And he said, I appear to you for a purpose to make you a minister, a witness. And then in verse 19, he says, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. 
Paul was, was pulled by something that was beyond the natural, beyond his experience. He said, I haven't been disobedient to the heavenly vision. My prayer tonight is that some of you are going to be open to receive that heavenly vision to change the course of your destiny. Now in Acts chapter 20, we're going to read from verse 20 to 24. Paul is about to... Uh, He's leaving the Ephesian church. He had been serving there for about three years. And uh, he came back for a visit. And then he knew that he would never see them again. So he's given them his final saying, his, his last words. And so when we look at these last words, when you think about the last words you're going to share with somebody, you know, those are these, these are heartfelt. These aren't just, uh, well, you know, how are the flames doing? You know, or, you know you're, going to talk, you're going to talk about something not trivial. I know, bad, really bad. But it's a race to the bottom. Come on. And they're not winning. We're not going to win this year. I prophesy. Yay, yay, I prophesy. He's a prophet. They shall not win this year. So Paul, let's, let's read Paul's last words to the Ephesians. Because this kind of explains who he is. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see... Now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now we're going to unpack that. Are you ready? So first of all, Paul, when he talks about this, and notice what he says, he says, I held nothing back. You know, we were singing this tonight. I love that worship, just talking about, you know, Christ be magnified in me. And so Paul was, he was all in. Listen, there's no part-time anointing for part-time Christians. If you want to live this adventure, you got to be all in. That's where the excitement comes in. So that when that long-haired hippie came to, you know, tell me about Jesus, when interrupt my money counting, you know, so five, I had five bucks. Okay, I had five bucks. It was, that night I got saved. You know, and I remember he began to share Jesus with me. And that, 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 that boy, you know, he opened up his Bible. And so I was, you know, back in those days, see, I was Roman Catholic. We never read the Bible. You know, we, we, that was for the priest. And so, and we always believed that, you know, you Protestants changed the Bible. And so this guy comes in and begins to share Christ with me. And he opens up his Bible. And so he underlined his Bible and highlighted things and wrote notes on the side. I had no idea that you were allowed to do that. So what I thought was that he was crossing out the scriptures he didn't like and writing in what his preference was. And so I was really suspicious of this guy, but he began to preach Jesus to me. And so something started to just stir within me. And, and then he asked me, he said, would you love to, he said, would you like to receive Jesus? Anthony, do you want to give your life to Christ? Well, I used to be really shy. You know, I know, I know you guys recognize that. And I could never speak in public. I was, you know, I was always picked on when I was a kid. So I, I had really poor self-esteem. I was a people pleaser. You know, I was a slave to everybody else's opinion. I was so desperate to be on the in with people. I would do whatever it took to get liked and to be invited, to be on the in crowd. So that led me to a life of just being really wild, got me in trouble with the law. But I just was so empty on the inside. And I thought, if I give my life to Christ, I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going to lose, you know, all this reputation that I've built over the last few years. And so I looked at him and I said to him, Mitch, listen, I may not be red hot on fire for God like you. Now, listen, I've never read the Bible. I didn't know that verse was in the Bible. I said, I'm not red hot on fire for God like you, Mitch, but I'm not cold either. I'm lukewarm. He opened up the Bible to Revelation chapter 3 where Jesus saying, says, I know your works that thou art neither cold nor hot but lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Man, I tell you, I knew that it was all in or all out. I wasn't going to walk the fence. Listen, I refuse to live in mediocrity. There's far too much, up, you know, but far too much competition. And so that night I got on my knees and I invited Christ to come into my life. I didn't join church. I didn't gain a religion. I didn't, I didn't turn over, a, you know, a new year's resolution. I had a God encounter. I experienced Jesus that night. I knew that he was alive and I, I felt this burden of shame and guilt and this heaviness just lift off my life. And I was like, this is real. 
And this voice spoke to me and said, yeah, this is real. You're going to tell your generation that I'm real. I got up off my face a new person. The Bible said if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new and they're of God. Something happened. I got an of God nature. I got an of God righteousness, an of God identity, an of God peace. Come on, an of God future. And it's available for everybody. So that was the beginning. Now, Paul, so Paul said, so the first thing is be all in, man. Be all in. You know, worship, you know, we love to sing the songs and, you know, raise our hands. We, we love to write music, but you can sing songs and not worship. First time worship is mentioned in the Bible is when Abraham went to offer up his son Isaac. You know, and uh, he said, uh, hey, the boy and I are going to go up there and worship. He was going to, he was going to give his Isaac. Sometimes worship is a surrender of something that you value so dearly. It's not necessarily a song. And then you find, you know, worship later. Well, we'll get into worship a little bit later on. But, uh, you know, so he was all in. That's just, I got to get back to my message. Stay on track, Anthony. Thank you. I kept back nothing. This is where the adventure begins. Let's go down a few verses. And he says this, and see, now I go bound in spirit. Say bound in spirit. Ooh, I like that. You know, he was, but there was something about Paul. What I admire about Paul was he was driven by a heavenly vision. You know, and there's a difference between carrying a burden and having a call. Paul, he, he, he had a call. And I love this because, you know, this is available for any one of us today. You know, and so some people, they get a burden. You know, I really got a burden. And you can have a burden for something. You know, I remember my wife and I, we went down in Nicaragua. We were visiting and working on some of the, you know, the dumps and seeing all the people that were living, you know, they live. There's a whole community that's lived in these, you know, in these landfills. And so we, you know, we had a burden for them. So we all went out, we went out and we brought buckets of water and we washed their feet. We brought them new shoes and gave them lollipops. We did so. We had a burden. And a lot of times people get a burden, but a burden is not necessarily a call. A burden can be something that you see a, a need and so emotionally you're stirred up and you feel oh, I ought to do something about that that's a burden but not necessarily a call because Paul said I go bound not from my soul not from my emotions but I said I go bound in spirit there was something in his spirit that was just undeniable that was driving him and so when the call of God comes to your life like it's going to come to many of you tonight when the call of God comes it arrests you on the inside and a, and a, and a burden might, might weigh you down but a call stirs you up it invigorates you it infuses you with faith and possibility God sends his Holy Spirit to reveal to you listen on the inside what your eye hasn't seen what your ear hasn't heard neither what you could even conceive with your heart what the what the father has prepared for those who love him God wants to impregnate you with a spiritual heavenly vision come on mm. here's Anthony IQ of 90 we broke into TM Roberts elementary school and we just happened to find the, the filing cabinet with all of our test scores and everything. I found mine. We all found ours. We're going through our files. Hey, and we had done IQ tests. Like I'm in grade six or grade seven. And they're like, what's your IQ? And they're all like, oh, I'm 110. Oh, I'm 115. 100 is normal. I was 90. And so I, 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 I looked at it and it's kind of high. Come on, Anthony, show us, show us. I'm not want to show you. Took my pen out. And they said, hey, uh, Anthony, what's your IQ? I said, I don't want to show you. Ah, you're probably, a, you're probably an idiot. That's why. And I said, no, 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 I'm not. And they grabbed it out of my hand. It said 190. Thank God for the same color ink pen. I said, I just want to show you because, you know, I'm a genius, you know. Hey, God's not looking at your ability. He's looking at your availability. He's looking at your surrender. So he said, go bound in spirit. God wants to, he wants to put something on the inside of you. I remember one time I, I was, uh, one of my first missions trip, I went to the village of Guriatam. Anybody been to Guriatam? Have you heard of Guriatam? Okay, well, here's where it is. You go to the end of the world, you, and then you go another 30 minutes, and that's Guriatam. And so as I'm driving by Guriatam, I remember this one pastor who had brought me there. He said, uh, what do you see? And it was like one of the many villages in, in India and uh, lots of poor people. It was poor. It was dusty. It was dirty. And I said, man, I said, look at all these people. It's a harvest field. And then, you know, he laughed and he said, you know, I had an American pastor come through here, not to pick on the Americans. He said, but, you know, I had an American pastor come through here six months ago. I asked him the same question. And uh, I said, what did he say? He said, oh, what a garbage dump. What a, what a mess. 
So I didn't think anything about it. But about a year later, I'm invited to preach in that village. So I'm a young guy, and I'm just hungry. I want to just go with the gospel, you know. And so I go, and I, and I, I remember I, I, I arrived there. The pastor was gone, but a, an elder met me. And uh, the elder takes me to this field, and, and it's like, you know, it's, we're outside the village. It's outskirts of the village, and there's some holy cows, and the grass is this high. And I'm like, and I said, what's this? He goes, this is where you're going to preach. And I said, but the people, there was a school in the center of the village. Let's go preach in the school there where all the people are. And he goes, well, we don't know you, brother. And uh, so, you know, but you can preach here. And I said to him, sir, God didn't anoint me to preach the gospel to holy cows. I'm here to, you know, preach to people. And he looked at me and he said, really? He said, so how old are you? So I went, I'm 20 years old. <laughs> he said, are you married? I said, no, but don't have any kids. Hey. And he goes, uh, are you a pastor of a large church? I said, a large church? Oh, oh, no, no. I'm not a pastor of a large church. He goes, oh, you're a pastor of a small church. I said, uh, I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. He goes, are you ordained? And I said, no. He goes, are you licensed? I said, no. And he goes, meeting's at five. And he walked away. I felt this big. I felt like I got nothing. What am I doing? Who do I think I am anyway? So I went back to this little hotel room where I was staying and, and uh, I threw myself just on my face before God and I was like, what, who, what am I doing? What am I, who, what, what am I here? And then I was just feeling so bad. I felt sorry for myself and, and make things worse. I started having a Big Mac attack. I'm just like, I want a McDonald's. You know, like, I mean, you know you're desperate. You know you hit rock bottom when you're craving, you know, McDonald's, you know. And so I'm sitting there and I'm crying out to God. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. This guy doesn't believe in me. He's mocking me. He's like, you know, and, and, I, and I, I feel like I got nothing. And I thought, who, what, am I, what was I thinking to come preach in this village? And then I remember as I threw myself on the ground and I was laying there. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just kind of spoke to me. And he said, stand up on your feet. And as I stood up, the verse came to me. And I felt it like the Lord was just speaking to me. He said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit. And that your, sh your fruit should remain. And when I, when I recognized that, hey, and I didn't choose Jesus. He chose me. Listen. Listen, maybe nobody else sees anything in you tonight, but Jesus sees something in you. He called you. He chose you. He wants you. Come on, somebody. You're in the right place tonight. Well, let me tell you what happened. All of a sudden, it felt like someone put something around me, and I, and I got all excited. I just felt this authority. I felt this, this confidence, and, and I knew that God had anointed me. Listen, we, 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 got a, we got a heavenly treasure in this earthen vessel. It's not about what we got. It's about the bigness of the Christ that's on the inside of us. So that night I went to preach, and, and I preached, and they'd cut the grass down, and we had about, oh, maybe 500 people there that night, and we had about four holy cows, so it was a good, cra a good crowd, you know, and I'm just, I'm just presenting the gospel. I'm just pre halfway through preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit, that same voice, spoke to me and said, Now, son, I want you to, to, you know, to heal the deaf. I want the deaf ears to open up. Call the deaf forward. And I'm like, what? I haven't given the altar call yet. But anyway, I just felt this prompting. So I said, okay, all you deaf people, come to the front right now. Yeah, nobody moved. Nobody, nobody. Finally, I said, okay, if you brought someone that's deaf, you know. You know so, they, so, they, so they bring... This honestly happened, okay. And so, I, you know, and so they bring five people to the front. And I just, I just felt inspired. I said, now, I said, if Jesus has sent me to this village, here's what's going to happen. These ears are going to open in the power of his name. I'm not going to touch a single one of them. And if it doesn't happen, you can chase me out of this village. And I'll tell you what happened. It was like pop, 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 pop. That was five. All five ears opened up. Come on. And we had a, we, we had a harvest that came in. Now. Here's why, here's the cool thing. So I'm leaving that village. I'm leaving that village. I'm in the bus. I'm driving. I'm laughing. I'm excited. The, you know, it was just, a, it was an awesome time. God just visited that little village of Guriatham. And as I'm leaving, the, I felt the Lord speak to me. And he says, do you know why you saw harvest there? Because six months ago when you drove through that village and the pastor asked you, what do you see? You saw a harvest. Because what you see is what you get. Come on. What do you see? The Holy Spirit wants to enlarge the vision of what Christ can do through your life tonight. Come on. There's a city that needs to be reached by you. There's a community that needs the Christ in you to show up in a big way. With God all things are possible. So Paul says, I go now bound in my spirit. Burdens are heavy but calls invigorate. Paul went to preach 
And then the next thing it says here, and say, I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that are going to happen there. Not knowing. You know what? That's a, there's always that part of the call of God. In this adventure we live in, you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, uh, sometimes we think, well, I like to have all the ducks. I need to have all my ducks in a row. And when I have X number of dollars, I will just go. And, you know, I've discovered that uh, if you need to have all your T's crossed and I's dotted and ducks in a row, you're not going to experience the adventure that God has for you. Paul said, not knowing. Listen, you just never know what's going to happen. And part of that is because, well, number one, God wants you to live by faith. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to be obedient. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God goes with goers. He works with workers, but he doesn't sit with sitters. So you just got to go. You just got to go. You, you take the first step. I, I, yeah, I, I, got, I got a lot of stories. I've been in about 43 different countries of the world. And, uh, you know, sometimes God, he doesn't show you everything, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it just might uh, intimidate you. Uh, we've had some pretty crazy things happen. I, I you know, I, I, when I went to northern Pakistan, I was held at gunpoint twice in one night. I was the only, only, only white guy on a bus going up to this village of Banu, you know, to preach. Uh, another time we were chased out of the city of Kanpur with uh, 500 militant radical Hindus that came with torches to light us on fire. The preacher I was working with, like he's, he's running way ahead of me and I'm running after him, but he was a faster runner than me. And so I'm wearing the saval, you know, this, you know the, the Indian clothing, the clothing where they call it, the saval, not the sari, that's what the women wear. Uh, the savar kameez, I think it was called. So I was wearing that and the angry crowd was behind me. And, 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 and that preacher that I was working with, he got in the van, started to drive away without me. So I just joined, joined the crowd, kill the white man, kill the white man, you know. And, uh, Hey, I'm alive, okay? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> not knowing. There's always the not knowing. When I was in Ethiopia back in, I think it was 2012, we went to Waliso. And uh, the stadium that we had rented, we had the big field. We were surrounded by 10, 20,000 men that were chanting, kill them, kill them. Somebody had said that we had killed a priest and that we were destroying Orthodox churches. And it wasn't true. But a, a wild crowd of, uh, of militant Christians wanted to kill us. And all of a sudden, a gun battle broke out. Five people were shot. I mean, it was a pretty intense time. Uh, I don't know. Do you ever have, like, you know, gun battles? You know, no. I mean, I tell you, it's not fun when it happens. But, boy, it makes for great preaching stories. Paul said, see, now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing, not knowing. You're never going to know the things that are waiting for you there. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have some of these things happen. But, uh, you know, 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 but know this, that Christ is with you. And then he goes on to say, but the Holy Spirit testifies. I, I, the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, don't we? Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And then he said, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. You can't do this without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I, that's where I love environments like this where people are hungry and thirsty and just, you know, God, fill me. God, I want all that you got for me, you know, because the Holy Spirit, you know, I love the book of Acts. You read the book of Acts and it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit moves and, the, and then the, and the church is like, what, what was that? Think about the day of Pentecost. They're in a prayer meeting, 120 people. Holy Spirit comes down. There's fire. There's tongues of fire. There's a sound of wind. And all of a sudden they're all speaking in other tongues. And they, this has never happened before. And then, you know, they go out on the street and everybody's speaking speaking in languages and and it's just it looked like bedlam and then the crowd is gathering there these guys drunk and peter says these men are not drunk like you suppose and then what is then i like what he says he goes oh i know what this is this is that which was spoken by joel the prophet saying in the last days god said he'd pour out his spirit upon all flesh it was like that's what this is it's like the it was like the holy spirit moves and then the church kind of like what was that you know and they figure it out it's like when when peter was praying so the in acts chapter 10 Remember the story, up until Acts chapter 10, the gospel was only going to the Jews. Even though Jesus said, take this gospel to all the nations. So Peter's fasting and praying, and a sheet comes down filled with non-Jewish, non, well, Jewish, well, non-kosher food that the Jews were forbidden to eat. 
So, you know, there was like Italian sausage, there was prosciutto, there was crab, there was lobster. There was all this wonderful Italian food, calamari, you know, stuff they weren't allowed to eat. And, G- and, the, and the, in, the, in, the, in the vision, God says, Peter, kill and eat. And he goes, no, not so, Lord. I, he says, nothing unclean has ever come into my mouth. No. And three times the vision happens. And then Peter's like, God, what's the meaning of this vision? And you know, the story was that an angel had appeared to Cornelius. Now, get this. An Italian, an Italian, Cornelius was of the Italian regiment. The gospel went first to the Jews, then to the Italians. Why? I'll tell you why. Because God knew the church was going to need good coffee. And he said, let's get the Italians saved first. We're going to get some good coffee. And by the way, can I help you so you don't look like a manja cake? It's not espresso. Espresso. It's an S. Espresso. Say espresso. Slight rolling of the R, of the tongue. Espresso. Ah, bene, bene. Good. Bravo. Bravo. So then this vision happens, and Peter's trying to figure it out. Then in the next chapter, he says, wow. See, up until that time, Peter's experienced a lot of things. He's walked with Jesus. He's walked on water. He's seen the dead raised. Come on, he preached in the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. I mean, it was amazing what he experienced. But the fact is this. He was in his own little bubble, and the Holy Spirit wanted to give him a dream to let him know, hey, Peter, there's a whole world there. There's a lot more people that need to be reached with the gospel than the Jewish people. We got to get the Italians and then the Ethiopians because they make really good injera in Kitvo. And we got this gospel is for everybody and so the Holy Spirit wants to come into your life to enlarge your vision oh I love what what Peter said God has shown me not to call anybody common or unclean not only did the vision enlarge the his capacity or enlarge the sphere of his ministry it changed the way he saw people saints and sinners us and them Mm, the good no no I don't see anybody as saints and sinners. They're people. Paul said, uh, Peter said, God has shown me not to call anybody common or unclean. It's harvest. The Spirit wants you to look at people and see that's someone who Christ died for. That's value. There's, they, they're value in the eyes of God. All right, I got some more points to go. Uh, are you still with me? The Holy Spirit testifies. Okay, that chains and tribulation, you know, await me. And then he says, but none of these things move me. Come on, you cannot be moved by things. Don't be moved by things. And, uh, you know, these things. And some, some people, hey, listen, when you, when you meet Jesus and you start to walk with him, you've got to, I love some of the declarations we're making about, you know, being all out, all, all in for Jesus. Because, you know, it's so easy to let things distract you. Yeah, I meet people that say, well, you know, I went to, I used to date this person and then they quit, broke up with me. I'll never follow Jesus again. Like, come on. Can you just, you know, boo-hoo. Can you just like grow up a little bit? Like, what is that? Then you never met Jesus, my friend. I don't know what that's all about, you know. None of these things move me. You know, God's not against you having things. He just doesn't want things to have you. None of these things move me. And and then, then this is where I want to get to. This is my introduction. I'm almost finished my introduction. And then we're going to unpack it. He says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself that I might finish my race. Every one of you got a race. That I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And I, I want to focus in on that, you know, because I think it's important that we understand. So Paul, what I liked about Paul is that he had an understanding of the gospel that so many of the, you know, I, well, really, you know how many gospels there are in the New Testament? Did you know that there's five Gospels in the New Testament? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? But there's one more Gospel. Now, those four Gospels are amazing, but they describe the life and ministry of Jesus from natural eyes, right? They, they describe the crucifixion from, you know, the, their, their, uh, their, their perspective, their eyewitness accounts. You know, the Romans put the nails in. They put the crown of thorns and, you know, and this happened. They put the spear up through his heart. The, they describe everything that happened. They laid Jesus in the tomb. Three days later, the stone was rolled away. Come on, we celebrated that yesterday and he's still alive today. But that's, that's the four gospels. But there's another gospel that's so amazing that is the life transforming gospel. And it's the fifth gospel and that gospel is called the gospel of Paul. Paul talked about my gospel because what's the difference between 
Paul's gospel and the other four gospels is Paul gives us an inside view of what happened in Jesus when he was on the cross and when he rose from the dead, right? Because Paul tells us that, you know, he said, my old man was crucified with Christ. He said, when Jesus died, he didn't just die. I died with him. And when Jesus was buried, I was buried with him. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he took me with him. And when Jesus was ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, I was seated there too. He told us what happened on the inside. And then Paul says this. He said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, he talked about this is the great mystery. He said there's a great mystery in the gospel, and it's this. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ on the cross, not Christ in heaven, not Christ in the second coming, but listen, the revelation, the life changing, this will change everything when you recognize that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come on, how awesome is that? And he says, you know, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so Paul, I love Paul because he was driven with the vision to get this gospel, you know, to, he believed that everybody, you know, needed this gospel. In Romans chapter 1, he begins to talk about, uh, you know, he says, I'm a debtor to the wise, the unwise, the barbarians. He goes, I, I'm a debtor with this gospel. Now, if you lent me $100, I'd be in debt to you, right? But uh, let's say you gave me $100 to give to, to James. So now I'm in debt. <laughs> Can I get a witness in the house? So now I, I'm indebted to James, right? You gave me 100 to give to him. So I'm indebted to James. So in the gospel, this ministry that we have, listen, the whole world it has a right to hear the gospel. And it's, listen, we are indebted to the world. Paul understood he received something from Jesus that he was responsible to get it to the nations of the world. And I want to encourage you that this is where I really believe what God wants to do tonight is there are some people here that are called to go to the nations to take this gospel. Paul said, I'm a debtor, man. And then he goes on to say, I'm, I'm not, he goes, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God to salvation. Come on, someone say, it is the power of God to salvation. You know, this is, I, I, I remember one time I was in Bulgaria. My wife and I, we were, we were driving to go preach in the city of Plevin back in, must have been the early 90s. And so uh, our flight was delayed, so we were a day late. And so we arrived and we, in Sofia and we had to drive to Plevin. And so it was about a three-hour drive, if I remember, and we jumped into this little, you know, car. It was, an, it was anyway, I think it was a Volkswagen. It was a Trabant. It was the, anyway, it was a piece of junk. And our driver, his name was Igor. And uh, Igor, which is a great name, by the way. I love that name, Igor. And, and uh, we get in the car, and we've got to get, you know, that we're, I'm preaching in about three hours. We've got to get to the city of Plevin. So we get in the car, and we're driving. And uh, it's a divided highway, and our our highway had all these potholes in it. But the other, you know, you go across the divide on the oncoming traffic, oncoming highway, it had just been paved. So Igor, he kind of smiles, you know, back with his like four teeth. He kind of smiles and, 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 and he says something, da da, you know, and, and uh, you know, and he crosses the, the divide and he gets over onto the oncoming traffic. And so we're driving down the highway this way, cars are coming this way. Sometimes, if you notice that it's really hard to pray, and other times it's really easy. That time was so easy to pray. I'm telling you, it was just flowing. It was just like, right, we're praying. And he's got the windshield wipers going. The lights are blinking. He's waving his hands out there. And I'm just like, this is crazy. We're going back and forth, back and forth. Three hours later, we arrive in the city of Plevin. We get to Plevin, and I'm just like, I'm rattled. I'm shaken. I'm not ready to preach. I don't feel ready to minister. You know, we, we get to the hotel, and, and as soon as I arrive in the, in the foyer, there's a press conference there, and they want to ask me questions. And I said, no, no, I don't got time for questions. I said, I got to get ready. So I go upstairs, I, and I throw myself on the bed. I start getting my Bible out, getting my notes ready. You know, I feel so unqualified. I feel like I'm not ready one bit for this. And there's a knock at the door. It's the pastor. He says, come on, the crowd is ready. We got to go now. So we go out the front door of the hotel and there's 40,000 people that have packed the center square. We couldn't even get the car to get to the platform. And so I get into the, so we're going through the crowd, Madeline and I, and I'm just like, excuse me, excuse me, I need to get to the platform. I'm the preacher tonight. I need to get to the platform, please let me get through. So we're pushing our way through, we're pushing our way through. And we finally, we get to the platform. I stand up on the platform and there's like, I look around me and I feel the weight of 80,000 eyeballs and it's pretty heavy. 
So I go under the, I get off this platform, I go under the platform, and I throw myself on my face before God. And I said, God, this is going to be the biggest embarrassment in my entire life. What am I doing here? And I'm starting to, just to pray. And I started to pray in tongues and plead the blood. I just started to do everything I could possibly do. And then I felt that still small voice, the Holy Spirit saying, son, what are you doing? I said, I'm stirring myself up. I'm going to stir up the gift of God. I'm praying down the power. And, you know. and the Lord just said, preach my gospel. Because my gospel is the power of God and the salvation. Come on, somebody. We don't pray it down. We don't stir it up. We speak it out. And so, so I, I, I got up on the platform that night, and that was my message. The gospel is the power of God. Come on, it's the power of God to transform a life. It's the power of God, you know, to break the chains of addiction. It's the power of God to raise up the sick. Come on, the gospel is the power of God. And wherever you are seated, and if you are in the, if you are in the, in the if you can hear my voice, wherever you are, you are in the miracle territory of the gospel because the Lord works with, went with us, confirming His word. Listen when you preach this gospel Jesus works with you he goes with you confirming the word he doesn't confirm the preacher he confirms the message with signs following come on somebody when you preach the gospel you are releasing a miracle zone got up to preach that night and was so amazing because all of a sudden you know people start getting healed all over that crowd I mean it was amazing a few months ago we were in uh, uh, Madagascar we had gone to uh, Fiena Ransoa we had to rent there's no there's no commercial runway, so we rented a plane. We got in there. And when I arrived there, we had, we had planned everything. We got everything set up. And we arrived and found out that they canceled our permission for the field. Now, we had printed 25,000 posters, 100,000 handbills, put advertising all over, you know, come to the, you know, our friendship festival. We had this field, but now we had lost the field. So we went to the, see the mayor. We said to the mayor, you got to find us something. We lost our field. And he says, well, we got a, a stadium in the center of the city, but there's two football matches. And I said, well, we'll bribe the teams. We'll give them money to play a different day. And he said, tell you what, well, we'll switch from night to daytime. They can play in the morning. You can have the stadium in the evenings. He says, but you can't use the field. You know, you're going to have to set up your platform way on the far side. So we set up our platform way on one side of the stadium. And the grandstands were on the other side of the field. And uh, it was covered so people could sit there. So one day notice. So I'm just thinking, what a fiasco. What a waste of money. You know, so how, how are people even going to know where we're at? So we hired some people on, you know, cars with loudspeakers. Started driving up and down the city and, you know, telling people where the new location was. And showed up the first night. There was about 2,000 people that was there. And they were sitting far in the stadium, far away. And... So I'm, I'm preaching the gospel and I'm kind of, and I'm looking and I'm like, man, can they even, I don't know if they even, can they, are they connecting? Are they hearing the word? Are they tracking with me? And I'm looking and I'm like, man, this is, a, I, it was so difficult. But you know, listen, there's, there's a power in proclaiming the gospel. Because the good news about Jesus is Jesus. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, he's the same today. Some people like to focus on Jesus of yesterday. Some people like to talk about Jesus in coming back. I like to talk about Jesus the same today. And if people will come to Jesus today, like the people in the Bible, they can experience the same thing. And so, so I'm preaching, and then I give the call for salvation, and, and the altar workers are handing out. I can see people moving around, but I have no idea if they even are connecting and getting what's going on. And so at that in the afternoon when I was praying, I felt the Lord speak to me, and he says, tonight when you go to minister to the sick, I want you to start with the paralytics. I want you to start with those that are paralyzed. We come with, you know, with canes and stretchers. And I said, all right, God, that's what we're going to do. And so I'm watching, and uh, what I didn't know was that they had laid all the sick people on the running track before the grandstands. And so it was so far away, I couldn't see what was going on. But, on the grand, but up on the stadium, though, they were looking down because they, were, you know, they couldn't come upstairs to, to sit. and to, you know, They just laid them there. And so they're watching. And so when I begin to pray and start to speak out like Paul did, he said, you know, in, in, in Acts chapter 14, it said Paul was at Lystra. And there he preached the gospel. And there sat a man you know, that was impotent in his, mother's, you know, in his legs since his mother's womb. The same heard Paul preaching. Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. When you preach the gospel, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Paul's preaching 
preaching this gospel, this message about Jesus. Come on. And all of a sudden, you know, Paul said, stand upright on your feet. And the man was instantly healed. Acts chapter 14. So that's, that, that's, our, that's our, you know, modus operandi. So I just said, now Jesus is here. He's right beside you. We begin to just proclaim healing to the sick. He was commanding the sick, rise up and walk in Jesus' name. And I couldn't see what was going on, but, you know, because it was so far. But the people in the grandstands, they're just kind of like watching here, eating their popcorn, looking. And all of a sudden, cripples got up and started to walk. And, uh, I mean, we saw about 40 people that got healed of paralysis and from stroke and all kinds of things among deaf and blind eyes. I tell you, that stadium was packed by the fourth night come on somebody can we give Jesus praise I think I got I got I got one I think I got a, a testimony video we can show it's Mr. Nino I just think it's kind of funny he was bedridden for two years and we got a before and after as his daughter began to bring him can we show that video and Sir, what is your name? Naina. Naina. Naina, you've been bedridden for two years. What happened? Was it a stroke? And, yeah. okay. and you couldn't walk for two years and you're the daughter is this true and what's your name Aina Aina and what happened tonight <laughs> this is the man I saw dancing I, I think I think we are. I, I should become a Malagasy. <laughs> Jesus is absolutely wonderful. Two years bedridden. This is good news of great joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Come on, worship team, come on up here. We're gonna we're gonna bring it to an end here. You know, this this gospel is amazing. And uh, I just sharing some of these stories tonight because I want you to grasp the fact that God is just looking for ordinary people that are just willing to connect with an extraordinary Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants to get a hold of you tonight and he's looking for that note of surrender because I believe there's a world out there that just needs the message that you and I carry. Come on, we got a heavenly treasure in our earthen vessel. God's just looking for a note of surrender for someone to say, God, here I am, use me. I think what God did through my life, taking me from Cranbrook, B.C., and just an ordinary person, was just willing, you know, to say yes to the call of God and just to, to begin to follow in simple faith. And God's grace has been so amazing. And Paul said that I would finish my race with joy. You know, and the ministry I've received from the Lord, run my race. Well, I don't know what your race is, what it looks like, what field it's in. But I want you to know that he that called you is able, you know, to bring it to total completion. He that started a good work in you, he's going to finish it. But tonight, are you willing just to say yes to Jesus? Say, Lord, here I am, you know, because he's looking for someone. He's not looking at your ability. He's looking at your availability. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you tonight. And God, as, I, as we bring this service to a close, Jesus, I thank you for, I ask you to, to speak to hearts, deep speaks to deep, God. And uh, what I would so failed to do with my own ability, God, I thank you that you can, you speak so clearly because your sheep hear your voice, Jesus. And God, I sense tonight that, Lord, you want to do, you want to set some people apart. There, there's some God encounters that need to happen tonight, Jesus. There's a young man, there's a young woman that needs to say yes to the call of God. That there's something that's uh, on the inside of them, God, that, you're, that you've placed there. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you tonight to work. God, I thank you that somebody's going to receive, Father, an anointing, a calling, a vision for the regions beyond. 
Lord, I think about Paul who just said that my preaching and my, and my speech was not in the persuasive words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration and in the power of the Spirit that our faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, in the ability of God. Father, I pray for somebody who's got it all up in the head, but doesn't have it in the heart. Father, that, that, your, that this faith would reside, God, in the, in, the, in the power of God, in the ability of God. Listen. I just, the other place of worship in the Bible is found in Revelations chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul says, you know, you know, to surrender your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable for God. That's your true worship. Yeah, worship, you know, I love the worship experience, but worship is when we surrender. That's worship. All you've got to do is surrender yourself. Lord, here I am. The Bible says to present your bodies. Present your bodies. God, I'm here. God, I'm here. I, I, I make myself available. God, I'm a piece of clay. I'm just a piece of clay. But I'm thankful for the heavenly treasure that lives on the inside. Paul said that this, our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but it's of God who's made us able ministers of the new covenant. There's one thing that I feel that I failed so miserably in trying to communicate is that our sufficiency is of God. Christ lives on the inside of you. Come on. His grace is there for you tonight. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Father, just come right now tonight. Holy Spirit, thank you. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Let's all stand to our feet tonight.